Okay, here's round two. Um, another stellar panel, uh, but a more hapless uh, facilitator, namely myself. I'm Joel Rogers. <laughs> I teach at the University of Wisconsin, where I run a think and do tank called Cows. Uh, uh, uh. We provide milk for the movement. Uh, and uh, what we're uh, what this panel is about is uh, it has a little bit of background. Arrow was, I forget what the initial messaging was, but people used to always say, okay, well, it's supposed to be significant, targeted, and short. Uh, it will come to an end. And it was a lot more money than a lot of people in this space had ever seen dedicated to good purposes, but it will be coming to an end. Um, it is coming to an end, uh, including the, uh, the uh, substantial investments that were made in building up the, uh, uh, what you might call the building retrofit, uh, industry and market, uh, what I call BRIM. Okay, uh, this thing is not really uh, an industry, uh, properly speaking. It's not really a market as we're used to things being uh, in 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 well organized ways. Right? You have a uh, what? What is a market? It connects uh, supply and demand. A series of relatively easy, costless exchanges. Um, in the case of uh, uh, building retrofits. Uh, <coughs> Uh, what would that mean? It would mean you'd have, uh, and these are sort of characteristic of all markets, uh, you, you want to have uh, high quality producers. Uh, and so you've got supply, and you've got demand, and you've got exchange. That's basically what a market does. You want to have high quality producers, you want to have adequate labor supply, skilled labor, probably want some credentials in that labor market to make it possible for people to move into and out of it. Uh, you want uh, well developed supply chains, you want uh, OEM uh, certifications of different sorts. You want standards all over the place on production. We don't really have that completely developed in this efficiency market. Um, you want to have demand, obviously. And as, uh, as uh, Nancy was saying at the outset, when they, they started, when uh, the Biden task force started with uh, uh, the retrofit through a ramp up thing, the first major barrier is that most people actually don't know much about what they could save. Uh, they've got all sorts of uh, principal agent problems, they've got all sorts of motives going all over the place, they've got problems in tenancy, they've got all sorts of problems. The, the, in some ways, energy efficiency is an obvious thing. It would seem to be like the killer app that everyone should do, but as we all know, it's very seldom done. Uh, and that's because of all sorts of transactions costs that are in the way. Uh, customers also have alternative uses of their capital, and now they're currently underwater in different ways. Uh, there's a lot of distrust of the contractors, blah, blah, blah. All this is familiar to the people in this room uh, and was familiar to the Obama administration two years ago when it started out to try to you know, get, get this industry developing. What we're going to try to do in this panel is talk to some people who have been important players in that effort to develop that industry, to get more standards in, to improve the level of quality, to reduce customer uh, information problems and other barriers, and sort of say, and we, we do want to get to all of you as well, uh, so how are things going? Uh, what's the general state of the industry from your point of view? Uh, what, are, what are the most significant uh, uh, accomplishments you've seen in the last year or so? Thinking about it as building an industry, not just a, a series of programs, but an industry that's going to be ongoing and sustaining, that has a clear value proposition, that's produced by people and demanded by people, and, you know, like an industry industry. What do you see as uh, the major development thus far? Uh, what do you see as major barriers? What are your what are your ideal solutions to those barriers? It's sort of a you know let's take a, let's step back after two years of era to look for the future development of the industry. Emerald Cities, of course, wants this not just to be a well-functioning industry, but a high road industry. By which we mean we want the we want the inclusion, the equity, the good jobs, uh, uh, and we're finally joining. Uh, Jason did a brilliant job stalling, Excellent. and uh, Thank you, I hope Tricia will uh, testify to that. But, you know. <laughs> okay, so you have the uh, the introductions of all these people uh, moving from I don't know how they're ordered here. Uh, D -d -d. Oh, I'm sorry. There's one other announcement to make. At some point during this session, maybe in half an hour, maybe in 40 minutes, maybe in two minutes, we don't know. <laughs> uh, Valerie Jarrett will come in and want to say something. At which point. Uh, or we proposed let her say whatever she wants. <laughs> and uh, us all being adults and all of you being seasoned politicos, I'm sure you agree, and so we'll just do that. Okay, so wherever we are in the discussion. Um, 
uh, but we have here, we, you really do have a nice panel here. Uh, uh, Trent Allen, uh, uh, Director of, of uh, Cities Utilities Program, Citibank, you know, the too big to fail bank, you know, the Citibank, has worked in the municipal space and with the nonprofits for a very, very long time, very acquainted with the financing problems, especially in the urban area. Uh, the ins and outs of the, of the Arab bonds and everything else and, and why the banks are not loaning right now and, and what, what to do with the, with the building. Ash, uh, Ash Awad is from McKinstry, uh, one of the uh, uh, independent, probably along with Amoresco and Noresco, maybe one of the leading independent, uh, I think, uh, ESCO, energy service company, uh, vending uh, energy uh, services, uh, doing, um, uh, he'll probably talk about this, these, uh, these uh, energy uh, savings performance contracts. <coughs> uh, Kathleen Hogan to Trent's uh, uh, stage left, I guess, your right. Uh, uh, is uh, probably needs no introduction. She's, uh, you know, she was the person who was critical in, in putting uh, Energy Star together uh, years ago when she was at EPA. Well, probably the only successful American energy uh, uh, environmental policy export, I think, uh, to the rest of the world. That that's uh, my. That's not, she wouldn't say that, but I would say that. Uh, and right now she's at the uh, Department of uh, of Energy itself. She was at EPA, um, and she's a Deputy Assistant Secretary. Uh, basically doing, I guess, on a temporary basis with Kathleen, with Kathy Choi, uh, otherwise happy to do. Anyway, she's the big cheese now at EERE and has run the Watt program and a bunch of other stuff. She can say, as far as I'm concerned, whatever she wants about what she thinks the major accomplishments and policy are, but that's what her tour d'oris on will be. Um, then you've got uh, 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 Matt, what is your last name here, Matt? I'm not, I don't know my thing here. McCaffrey. Yeah, I'm sorry, Matt McCaffrey. <laughs> who's a uh, uh, part of this uh, startup that a lot of you know about. It's no longer just a startup, I guess, Opower, uh, which has been very, very creative in, in doing deals with utilities to get better customer data uh, from them and then uh, driving up customer demand in a significant way. And now with significant spread, we want Matt to talk not just about the customer stuff that Opower does, but also wh where he sees the major barriers with utilities as being part of the business end of things. Uh, then you've got Dorothy Stoneman, probably doesn't need an introduction, head of Youth Bill, and Art Luhan, who has been delegated by the Building Trades to be their special delegate uh, for Emerald Cities. And then finally, the latecomer Jason Smith, or Jason Walsh, sorry, uh, uh, longtime activist uh, in, uh, I don't know, the Workforce Alliance, Blue Green, uh, uh, what else? So many Not things. Apollo, uh, yeah, uh, Green for All, etc. Uh, currently at the Blue Green Alliance who has worked for years to try to build alliances in these different towns. And what I'm going to ask him about is uh, uh, w w about the glue that Emerald Cities proposed, proposed, purports to provide uh, and how he sees that developing. How are we doing on the coordination of all the pieces that were highlighted in the mayor's remarks and Angela's remarks before? So, uh, Ash, why don't we start with you? Just from the business perspective, this is the most straightforward business perspective. Uh, you're in the energy efficiency industry. That's what you're bending. How is it going? What are the barriers, et cetera? It's going better than when I started in the industry 20 years ago. So I, you know, I would say McKinstry does do energy services work, but um, you know, keep in mind for those of you that don't know McKinstry, we, we're also a design build contractor and uh, McKinstry is signatory to 17 or 20 different trades unions. And so we're not only doing energy efficiency retrofit work, but we're actually out there doing new construction work and service work and uh, operating buildings. So just a little context. Uh, I, I would say just in terms of landscape, you know, the awareness level of energy efficiency clearly is at all-time high, uh, you know, as evidenced by uh, this room. And a lot, a lot of big rooms like this, lots of collaboration, lots of conversation. Um, I guess I wonder out loud sometimes whether, you know, we've, we've got too much discussion and not enough action. Um, I wonder if... Um, if, if that's something we all need to work on, um, because I think we've, we've been in a lot of these big rooms, and uh, I think I'm, I'm really pleased that this group is really talking about what to do to keep the scale going and to build the business. So I think that's important. Um, companies like McKinstry are growing in the energy efficiency industry. I should note we mostly represent non-residential work, um, not residential work. So it's about 80 billion square feet of non-residential space uh, that exists out there that's public, private, institutional, uh, and that's the, those are the, that's the building stock that we mostly uh, look after and work to make more energy efficient. 
And I think companies like ours are growing at a reasonable clip even during the recession. I think if you've been in this energy efficiency business and you're not growing at 10 to 20 percent a year, um, you may actually have the wrong formula. So things are going well, particularly in, 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 in lieu of the recession. Uh, but, you know, there are a few challenges. Should I, should I address them now or do you yeah. want me to hold the challenges? Uh, no, yeah, actually, let's do a round. We'll just do a very quick thing like you just did for sure. everyone, and then we'll get into the challenges. Yeah, it'll be simple. And then Great. solutions or whatever. Challenges and solutions will be the next round, okay? Okay. All right, so Trent, <laughs> how's it going? How's business? <laughs> actually, not that bad. But, uh, <laughs> uh, what, what's happening? Sure. Um, I, I would say that energy efficiency um, as a business is something that's important um, to city because it's important to our clients. Uh, whether you are a municipality, whether you are individuals, whether you're corporations who are looking for ways to save, uh, sa save money on your energy bills, that's something that's important to us. But what, how it sort of categorized the last two years is there's some smoke, but I don't think there's quite yet fire. Um, and by that I mean we don't quite yet see the makings of a longer term market over time. And with that ability to identify a longer term market over time being demand, it's hard to build a business around that and even provide financing for that. And so I believe that we're going to get into the challenges here in a little while and we have some, have some thoughts on sort of things that can help develop the demand as well as help to create the financing that, that's necessary to uh, continue that demand. But that is sort of where I see sort of the landscape as we sit today. And uh, I'll leave some time for others. Okay. Sure. And I'll uh, just kick this off with a few words uh, from my side as well. Uh, I think the conversation here is um, about the challenges in sort of a post-recovery act period. But I think before we get there, uh, it would be helpful just to think for a moment about the challenges of the recovery act era and, uh, and really going from zero to 60 with a lot of energy efficiency and renewable energy investment. And I think it is uh, good to look and see what uh, folk across the country are accomplishing now with the recovery act and uh, the amazing level of activity and ramp up uh, that so many across the country have achieved. Uh, as we look today, we see that uh, between 25,000 and 30,000 homes are being weatherized on a monthly basis. Uh, and that as you look across the uh, energy efficiency and conservation block grant program, which is putting, I think, a billion dollars into the public sector uh, building investment uh, alone uh, as part of its three billion, uh, we're seeing that that is being, it has also achieved a monthly spend rate of about 100 million, which was uh, its target spend rate. So we're seeing all these programs up and doing what it is uh, they were targeted to do. Uh, so that's great stuff. Uh, and then we do get to the challenge of uh, what others have already spoken to, what, which is what is the sustainable market and um, for energy efficiency investment. And it is across um, all the markets uh, where we would like to see it happen. It's across the low income. It's across um, the, you know, the middle class homes, uh, commercial, uh, private, and public. Uh, and we're putting a lot of thought into each of those uh, and the things uh, that will be necessary to do that. And I think as we start to talk about solutions, um, you know, it isn't that there is one answer. It's uh, many things that have to come together all at once to create this industry. It's a little bit different by the market segments in which we operate. Uh, and it's also linked to um, the policies that we're going to put in place to create that sustainable design. Uh, so I guess that's also why we do have to uh, keep doing uh, a lot of this dialogue because the policies that need to be put in place really are at the state and the local level. Um, so we need to flesh those out and we need to be able to uh, communicate the benefits to them because a lot of times, as we, we know, policy change is, is hard. Um, so that's my overview. Um, I'm coming from a software background or a software company and a policy background. So, uh, but I've worked with utilities on their energy efficiency portfolios for, for some time. Um, what we're seeing now is, is a transition away, at least from the OPower perspective, uh, from a, hard, a strictly hardware-based approach um, to, to a more software or messaging uh, or different software and messaging-based uh, solutions as part of that portfolio of solutions that's necessary to achieve all cost-effective energy efficiency, as, as Kathleen was just uh, alluding to. Uh, now, for us, it's been, uh, it, it's been a tremendous growth period, and there are a lot of companies like Opower 
that have experienced the same type of growth. Um, two years ago, we were working with, with nine utilities. We're now working with 49 utilities in 22 states. Um, by the end of the year, we're going to hit, you know, 10 million households. Now that, 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 that's a large number. We're very happy about that. But, but uh, for the residential market, um, that means that there are that, that there's there's a great uh, market potential out there that um, that uh, we can all move toward and that companies uh, like Opower can move toward. Um, so we've seen uh, an increase in, in efficiency spending and utility administered uh, efficiency from from 2006 through through 2009. Well, uh, through through the present day, um, but uh, we only have data um, uh, for uh, through 2009. Um, and uh, and we're, we're seeing um, tremendous uh, tremendous savings potential. Um, just to put it in perspective, Opower alone, uh, through our through through our messaging platform, through our behavior risk plat platform, we've saved over 200 gigawatt hours of, of electricity. Um, that's equivalent to about a quarter of the entire output of the U.S. solar industry. Um, now, I, I don't mean to discount solar. I think that we need solar, we need wind, we need other low carbon technologies. But it just uh, points out the, the cost effectiveness of efficiency. We're doing it for about three to four cents a kilowatt hour, as are other companies that are involved in the space. Um, not only is that more cost effective than solar, but that's more cost effective than coal in a lot of cases. Um, so there, 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 there are uh, two, two messages there. Um, one, we, we can pursue this as a bridge to um, reach a low carbon economy that I think everybody in this room recognizes uh, we should reach. But two, that e even though efficiency is, uh, is a very cost-effective resource, it does cost something. Um, and, and the uh, utility-administered and third-party-administered programs are the, uh, are the programs that are really driving the growth in the efficiency sector in the U.S. And I think that, that, that the market and the different stakeholders are, are, are realizing that potential now. Dorothy, creating opportunity for low-income youth. Yep. Uh, how, how's it going? How's that working for you? <laughs> Sarah Palin might say. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's going good for us. I mean, Emerald Cities is committed to creating a real pathway into these green jobs and real careers for low-income young people and young adults. Uh, and there's a whole network of job training programs which are designed to get into the alleys and bring the young people and provide them hope and bring them into various training. There's Job Corps, there's Service and Conservation Corps, there's Workforce Investment Act programs, there's, there's vocational technical schools, there's the unions training centers, and there's, so there, there are networks that exist to provide a pathway for training. Now, I can talk most effectively about the Youth Build Pathway, which is the one that I am in charge of and have built, and which is publicly funded in the Department of Labor, as a particular training path for young people who've been out of school, 93% have dropped out of high school, and, uh, and we train them in construction. And they build affordable housing in their communities. Their programs are sponsored by the local community development corporations that own some of that housing. Some of the public housing authorities sponsor them. Uh, local nonprofit organizations recruit the young people, engage them full time, give them the access to a high school diploma while teaching them construction skills. Now, what's happened over the past five years, and there are 273 youth build programs engaging 10,000 young people full time across the country. Uh, what's happened in the last five years is that we've had to go through a radical change in how we do it, right? We've had to teach all these programs how to build green, first of all. How, all the construction managers had to learn that. We had to teach them. We had to get money from Walmart and from Bank of America and from Sangoban and from the Department of Labor when the ARA funds came in in 2008, then that built on that. But then we had to teach the young people. How do you, what are the skills you need? You had to create certifications had, and pipelines for them, and that there were green careers, and that environmental sustainability was important, important to their neighborhoods and to their lives and to the, to the planet, and get them involved from a grassroots perspective as people wanting to help green the environment. And so they've put that into their platforms, into their, their ways of ending poverty, their platform for ending poverty includes now the sixth component is to protect the planet and change the conditions in our communities around that. So 
Uh, then we've worked up partnerships with people because then you've got to have the placements. You've got to have partnerships with the public housing authorities, with the labor unions, with the building trade councils, uh, with the with the Amorescos, with everybody, so that the young people who've gotten this training and these certification can actually get placed in jobs. We know how to inspire the young people, attract the young people, make them feel hopeful, give them skills, make them take responsibility for their environment, but the jobs piece is still not wide open. The fact that there's so many construction workers on the bench, the fact that there's not at this moment a shortage of construction workers means that we're, we're pushing there and a lot of what's going to happen until those jobs open up um, and until there's a real, until the public housing authorities are really, they've got the community labor agreements and they're actually hiring people living in the housing projects and they're implementing section three, the young people are going to end up going to community colleges instead of into the jobs that they've been trained for. So that's the problem at the moment. Bart, we heard on the mayor's panel about the uh, difficulties of reconciling union representation, especially in the building trades, with equity concern in cities. Uh, why don't you speak to that in progress, if, if any, in the last well, year or two? Well, I'd like to start off, first of all, by thanking the mayors that, that did remain here because we view them as critical partners in uh, the Emerald Cities uh, Collaborative, and we appreciate you sticking around. Um, from the, the building trades perspective, as Dorothy mentioned, we have unemployment, high unemployment, record unemployment in every one of the targeted Emerald cities. But I think what's important and what's critical for investors to understand, as well as employers and mayors, that our training programs are still intact. Uh, they, those are the programs that have trained the skilled workforce uh, over the past hundred years. Uh, we have over a thousand training facilities and every one of them trains uh, to green. If they haven't, they're, they're putting modules in to provide the, the green training. Uh, they do have the, the certifications that you talked about. Uh, they are working with the community colleges in, in, many, in many communities as well as four-year institutions for those individuals that want to continue the, the higher education. Uh, it, it's important and critical to understand that the true pathways out of poverty and into the middle class as we've seen it is through union apprenticeship programs. And so the, the, the closer that we can work with those community members, those uh, organizations like Dorothy's, uh, using this time when we have this high unemployment to develop these critical uh, workforce development pipelines, to have them put in place when the demand uh, is going to surge, and we know that at some point in the near future, it, it will surge again. And we want to ensure that, that we have uh, the ability to, to get our members back to work, but to also ensure that those community representatives are prepared and ready to, to enter those pathways into those apprenticeship programs. So, you know, that's the one critical message that uh, we have is the training programs. They're, they're alive and they're well, and I just heard something interesting this morning, that as the workforce uh, hours have been declining, the expense of the training programs have been increasing because the membership is going back to those training facilities, and much like any other training uh, continuing education program, they're going back and working on their welding skills. They're working on those green components. Uh, so in one sense, that's great to hear. Uh, it's a bit of a financial burden, but I think it's something that, that, you know, that we'll absorb here in the short term. So the, the critical message to the, our uh, important par partners like the mayors, the investors, the contractors, is that we're fully capable of having the workforce ready, the skilled workforce, to do anything in uh, the entire green community and in every sector, whether it's uh, residential, whether it's the commercial, industrial, we will have the workforce uh, uh, because all of our programs are jointly administered by the <coughs> unions and by the employer representatives, the McKinstries of the world that sit down and uh, work together to develop those, uh, those training programs. Okay. Thank you.
And Jason, the the building trades are a very, very important set of union allies in the in the retrofit project that Emerald Cities is doing. But of course, we've got bigger ambitions still. We want these high road cities that are high road in every aspect of what they're operating, and that gets us into industrials and a variety of other unions as well. Uh, you've been working the the labor community, labor enviro alliance uh, between. Uh, a variety of unions, and also long experienced in the you know the politics of coalition building, and um, you know what the uh, what advocates are like: sick people stealing each other's medicine, and you know, things like that. Uh, comment on how you see uh, the current state of play in politics, in, um, in building alliances. <clears throat> Uh, before getting to challenges and solutions, yeah. yeah so yeah. real quickly, I mean, I, you know, so I think we, I mean, at the more programmatic or local level, I think we are beginning to see sort of an Emerald Cities model emerging, right, that combines and integrates targeted hiring with skill standards, with financing, with demand aggregation, um, all of those different pieces. Um, and we're seeing that in Portland, we're seeing that in New York State, we're seeing it in Massachusetts. Um, we are seeing some kind of shining examples from Recovery Act implementation. Um, I mean, take Las Vegas, <laughs> right? Take local 873, which is a laborer's local, and their partnership with the Community Action Agency, Southern uh, Help of Southern Nevada. I mean, they knocked out a thousand units in six months and single-handedly blew Nevada's statewide goal out of the water, <laughs> right? And they did it in a high road, high quality way. Um, but of course, we are not going to scale everywhere, right? If we only do that in a few select places, uh, we are in trouble. And there are a, a set of challenges we're going to have to overcome in order to get to scale. Uh, there's also the issue, of course, of uh, national alliances, national coalitions. I mean, I do think one of the things that came out of this last year, uh, Blue-Green Alliance and many others participated in coalitions in support of, of Homestar legislation, uh, which was essentially scaling up uh, building efficiency retrofits in the residential sector, and then the Building Star uh, Coalition, which did the same thing in the commercial sector, both of which got pretty damn close, right? Uh, we passed the House with, with, with Homestar, got very close in the Senate. And I mean, I have to say the coalition that came together in support of that, from business to labor to enviros to justice groups, was significant and I think really promising. And whether we can do that in a new political environment, in a new fiscal environment remains to be seen, but I think it's something to build on. Excellent. So, so Trent, you're, you're the first person to say, well, I just don't see this industry. I don't see the market. We, we can't finance something that doesn't exist. Can you explain those provocative remarks? <laughs> <clears throat> and then we'll get to Excellent. Kathleen uh, saying, well, it could exist, but you have to do 15 Excellent. simultaneous, you count to solve 16 different simultaneous equations. Actually, I feel at the bad. same time, and, and we, we, they could all screw up. And then we'll go to, to uh, uh, McKinstry. Yeah. I feel bad that that's provocative. Um, <laughs> The, the truth of the matter is, is, is that I can't tell you today, and I'm not sure there are many here can tell you that over this year, the next two years, next five years, whether we have a $1 million a year, $10 million a year, or $100 million a year industry. And each one of those sizes of industry require different amounts of infrastructure and, and have different amount of interest from the financial markets. And not knowing, having that uh, ambiguity with regards to is there 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 uh, requires that there has to be some other parties that come into place and the federal government has done a wonderful job through ARA uh, of providing sort of that stimulus that allows for credit enhancement for a number of communities for revolving loan funds that allowed for uh, some of the bond programs qualified energy conservation bonds another one uh, that can help sort of jumpstart and facilitate that in communities. However, the problem is it isn't enough yet for the capital markets to come off the sidelines. Um, so what you end up with is part of a question of, so who do you look to for projects? And for the mayors in, 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 the, in the room, uh, obviously you look to the, the, the local government who can aggregate and who can say, we're going to put our buildings in. That's a good place to start. That's where you should start. Because we now, one, have size, so that gets uh, financial uh, institutions interested because there's a certain size of investment that can be in there. But that only has a certain lifespan beyond that. So the problem, so, so, so the challenge here is, is how do you utilize the 
local government building sector, whether that's government buildings, whether that could be public housing, and use that to have a transition into commercial industrial as well as potentially into residential. Residential is, is, is a very difficult place to try to analyze the individual credits of individual homeowners. That is, that is where this starts to break down. You can do it a lot easier with municipalities. You can do it a little bit more difficult with commercial industrial, residential level. That's the harder, that's the harder uh, 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 category to, to get at. That requires an awful lot of subsidy and in this financial environment, I'm not sure how the private capital goes after that sector first. So your line very clearly is, look, start with the easy stuff, start with the government buildings, maybe that will be a, a spark that will light the flame eventually, or whatever the metaphor is. Uh, but how do you see that leading to the development of the market? Why, do, why, do, why won't that just be a, a dead you know, flame that goes out right away to continue this pyromanic, pyromanic metaphor? <laughs> For which uh, I apologize. Yeah. Uh, what I see is what that can do is to, one, create, start to create what the benefits are. Okay. Um, or establish a framework for addressing what are the benefits of energy efficiency or whatever someone wants to call it. Um, that has to be first and foremost and in in delivering what the value proposition is beyond just municipal governments into commercial industrial. What we're talking about here more importantly is just a sizing. Um, it is, okay. if you could aggregate all the smaller residentials then have a big pool then that would be great too but you have to then analyze all the individual Homes. Starting a local government allows you to start with a larger, more credit worthy entity than we're talking about individual uh, 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 homeowners, and, right. and that's why we start there. So you just want a, a good business book that's developed and results? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, our expected visitor has in fact arrived, <laughs> Dr. Valerie Jack. And uh, Valerie, we agreed that uh, as soon as you arrived, we would stop everything. Yeah, but we knew you'd say that and not really mean it. But we're still going <laughs> to stop everything. Do mean it. I don't think it's good mean it. But we're delighted you're here. Uh, so please, make a couple of remarks, then we'll go back to the other discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for letting me just butt in like that so rudely in the middle of the panel. But I heard you were here, and I wanted to come over and just tell you how delighted we all are to have you so engaged in this Emerald Cities initiative. We were outside in the hall talking for a moment about it, and I feel that from my days working in city government in Chicago, I really gained this enormous appreciation for the potential of our cities around the country. And this initiative gives us the ability to really play to our strengths at a time when we need it most. And there's so many different ways that we can think creatively, share best practices, uh, heighten the awareness of the general population about what the potential we have here is. And it's something that the president is absolutely committed to. And, um, Oh, you have heard and will continue to hear, just one example I would give you is our effort to retrofit commercial buildings. Well, it's the perfect way to make um, our buildings more energy efficient, hire people who are currently unemployed due to the economy, and do something that's good for the environment as well. And so thinking of ideas like that and figuring out how we can bring them to scale, and, and through the President's efforts and the Recovery Act, we certainly did pump billions of dollars into efficiency and, and, and looking um, towards the future for jobs of the future, but we need to make sure that that's sustainable. And as everyone knows, the Recovery Act funds were temporary, and as they begin to um, deplete, we need to make sure that we have the ability to leverage the private sector and make sure that we have sustainable ability to continue to support this important initiative. So really my point in being here is not to in any way take away from the terrific program, but just to tell you on behalf of the President how important this is to him and how much he welcomes partnership with each and every one of you who is here today. And, um, and we're delighted for your effort and we look forward to continuing in this vein and thinking of new and continuing, um, and to continuing to make progress. So thank you and again for giving me for being so extraordinarily rude, but I wasn't going to let you be here without coming by and saying hello. So please go on with the panel and I'll look forward to a report from your progress today. Thank you guys. Okay, so 
go with the big buildings, get the business book, show the banks something that everyone else in the world has known forever, that energy actually saves money, efficiency <laughs> saves money? No, 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 no. Uh, no I, 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 will, I, I, will, I will say that. It's, it's not that energy efficiency saves money. This is not a conversation about whether you have verified savings, whether at the end of this, this whole question is about credit. Okay. Who's a, at the other end of the loan? Is there a credit worthy counterpart that's gonna pay you back? And we're not talking about whether we can verify savings because we can't actually finance against energy savings, at least in some of these projects. So what we're looking into is the underlying credit. For municipal buildings, we're looking through, the, will, the, will the city of Milwaukee pay us back? Well, we can analyze that. Uh, are we looking through some large commercial industrial uh, companies? Can, we, can they pay us back? We can analyze that. To look through to thousands of, hundreds of thousands of residents, that just requires a different, that, that requires a different analysis in this current time. Yeah. Um, and if you're trying to scale that up in a certain way, that's where you start to get sort of the rub, and that's all, that's all we're talking about here, is really looking at the credit counterparty, not discussing whether we believe energy efficiency actually creates savings. And a question that comes up all the time is, why can't you finance against the savings? Let's say you knew for sure that the savings were gonna be there. Why can't you just book that as an account receivable? Why doesn't Gatsby say, hey, that should increase your bond rating? Uh, that's terrific. And then I would ask you, how do you know the savings is gonna be there? Let's say what measure? Are we talking something okay. that's behavioral? Or are we talking something that's just truly technology? Okay. Uh, technology, does the technology degrade? How mm -hmm. are we looking at some of these questions? Okay, good, great. I know folks want to get in. This is good. <laughs> uh, let's give Ash a chance to say, okay, so you see, do you see uh, storm clouds on the industry, or you're just you're Mr. Upbeat, right? I well, I, yeah, I'm remarkably upbeat. Um, but then again, I was excited about energy efficiency and went to Washington State with the lowest energy rates in the country, and we made it work there. So, remarkably upbeat. You know, I. Uh, I, I'd like to kind of carry on a little bit about what uh, Trent you're saying. I, look, it, what, what it really comes down to is a scale of market, and um, I, I would just try to state it a slightly different way. There's a ton of work to be done in the public sector and institutional buildings. And I think that we overlook it by saying it's simple, it's done, it's on its way. And I think that's the challenge is, is that when we look across the spectrum, we have offices now in 16 states and growing, and this isn't necessarily a particular state issue or a city issue. It just so happens that much of the public sector buildings, much of the institutional buildings that include hospitals and universities, public and private, are just uh, underserved. There's, uh, and, and, there, and there sits there a wonderful opportunity with um, end users that are interested with a little bit of motive, a little bit of the right kind of financing to bring significant scale to those markets. I just want to give one example and then I'll, I'll just give you one idea to consider. Um, in Washington State, uh, this last legislative session, uh, a Jobs Act was passed. Uh, the Jobs Act focused $100 million just into the education market for the purpose of doing energy efficiency retrofit work. Uh, this money was approved in about May. The money started going through grant rounds in July. All the money ran out at about September. $300 million worth of work, real jobs being created right now, retrofitting our schools, improving the physical learning environment, and adding to the health and safety benefits that come from that work. Um, schools were ready, willing, and able. They were willing to take out tax-exempt municipal lease that companies like City and others have available. There was no overly innovative idea that was created to help them get off the ground except for a little bit of seed money. And that was just one vertical. And I would say that if another 100 million showed up, we would gobble that up quickly and get more work done. This is just one state, one vertical market, underserved. And I just worry that we're working too far outside the periphery and not into the core of where real opportunities lie. And I think that gives us the scale that you're talking about. But I want to just add one last element to this. Um, you know, efficiency, energy efficiency, uh, there's no strong belief in the power of the negative watt. We, we are absolutely willing to pay 15 and 20 cents for a renewable watt, uh, but we're not willing to pay any more than a penny or two for energy efficiency. I've done the math. You know, at eight cents 
for energy efficiency per kilowatt hour per year, we are creating a scale of energy efficiency that rivals any, any market industry growth that we've seen in the last 50 years. And the challenge is, is that the utilities are somewhat handcuffed. They create these cutesy efficiency programs because they're responding to some peanut butter response that we might ask them to do. And at the end of the day, they're underfunding the level of efficiency by an order of magnitude of 10. And that's the challenge, decoupling and giving our utilities the ability to go after a, uh, a, a megawatt just like they would go after a renewable watt is critical. And the challenge really comes down to scale and really looking at the aggregation of efficiency different than what we've been looking at. Uh, we believe that, and I, and I have to, I both agree with everything you've said, but I would just note that unless we figure out how to allow both our utilities to really capitalize on efficiency the way we drive them, force them to buy renewables, and unless we find ways of innovating and financing those kilowatt hours, those negative kilowatt hours, um, then I, I, think, I think we're just going to continue to have these really interesting discussions. We're going to wonder where the funding is going to come from, um, and we're never really going to get to scale. Kathleen, you've dealt with utilities all of your professional life uh, and uh, have had lots and lots of discussions with them and over at ERE. Everyone agrees we need some new mm -hmm. utility model for making some money. Um, how do you see that going? And what, and what are the, uh, the 10 different equations you think <laughs> you alluded to before that need to be solved as they actually are to scale? Right. Um, so as we all said, it's, it's not one thing we need. We need a, a bunch of things. And uh, the way we've been looking at it uh, and working with uh, so many of the ARA grantees and others around it uh, is trying to pull together these various elements into these new integrated deployment models. Uh, I guess our flagship effort has been something called Better Buildings, which uh, is funded uh, with EECBG dollars. Uh, the idea is, you know, folk are coming together and, you know, 34 grantees or so. Uh, to really uh, do neighborhood by neighborhood retrofits. The idea is trying to get to scale and bring a new business model uh, to the residential sector. Uh, and what's, what are the elements of a new um, approach like that other than trying to do neighborhood by neighborhood so you're reducing the transaction costs of going uh, one at a time? I mean, you are bringing financing to the table, you're bringing better information to the table uh, to motivate folk, uh, and you're bringing a skilled workforce. Um, so you're linking all these efforts into uh, the trained professionals. Now, that, of course, uh, is great uh, doing all that through a grant program and demonstrating you can do it, but it doesn't solve the question of what do you do uh, after the grant dollars are over. You still need these sustainable pathways or sustainable policies in place, uh, and so now you're back to uh, the question you're asking about uh, utilities and the role of um, them as aggregators or some of the other aggregators. Uh, and I think, you know, what, what can you do uh, in that area? Um, we have a governance structure here where the states are in charge of the regulation of their utilities. It is a state issue. Uh, certainly, we have looked in the past and seen states adopt new policies, and as a few of them do it and do a good job at it, the next few states will do that. Um, so I think that's really what we're, we have to do is uh, look to the states that are doing um, decoupling. And, and we all know it's not just decoupling. It's really putting energy efficiency on a level playing field uh, with uh, the d delivery uh, of a kilowatt. Uh, and this really keep educating folk. You know, we do have a um, policy infrastructure in this country where the commissioners um, that regulate the utilities uh, do uh, turn over a lot. Um, some of them are elected officials, some of them are political appointees. Every three, four years, they're sort of rotating out and new folk are rotating in. They don't necessarily have energy experience. Um, so it is something we have to figure out is how to educate those folk about how uh, what the least cost path is for this country from a competitive standpoint uh, in having low cost energy. And it's really low cost energy bills, not low cost rates, because higher rates um, can actually lead us to lower bills. Uh, so I think that's going to be a big part of, of what we all need to do. Try to talk to people in Seattle about <laughs> bills, not rates. Uh, yeah. well, you know that story. Uh, good, great. Um, uh, Matt? 
Yes, <laughs> you got that right. Well, well sh sure. If you. It, It, well, the, the, the changes really do happen at the state level. And, and we are, if you look back at, at the number of states in 2006 that had uh, performance incentives for achieving energy efficiency, at decoup that had decoupling, um, that, were, that were looking at, uh, uh, at other lost revenue adjustment mechanisms like decoupling, um, they've about doubled in that time. Um, not quite doubled, but we now have, uh, I guess, 22 or 23 states with performance incentives. Um, a similar number for decoupling. Um, we have 25 states with resource standards, and I think that that's another uh, complementary um, policy that, that really drives efficiency. And so when you look at the, at, at the utilities that are, that are spending the most and, more importantly, saving the most through their, through, through their efficiency programs, you see a direct correlation with the utilities that are in those states that have the resource standards and that have the performance incentives and, and, and decoupling mechanisms. So it really is a driver for, for uh, innovative approaches that allow for companies like Opower to really exist. Do you think we went to utilities in those states you just mentioned, or roughly half the states in the country said, what would you rather do, efficiency or generating some more power? Uh, and it's an equal, do you think that's an equal choice for you uh, uh, in terms of market? What do you think they would say? They would say, oh, yeah, yeah, no, we make a lot of money on efficiency. Um, I think that there's a business case for, for efficiency without those, uh, without those policies in place. Would you see a lot of utilities buying that case? That's the question. Uh, certainly. I, I actually think that a lot of utilities are looking at the merits of efficiency. I'm, uh, I'd like to point out a Southern Company. Um, and it, it's not direct efficiency, but, uh, but through their, their, their AMI deployment, their, uh -huh. their, their smart meter deployment, they looked at a, a, uh, 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 a service territory-wide deployment of, of smart meters and have actually uh, been uh, putting smart meters in the ground. They justified that on operational uh, benefits alone. They recognize that if they, can, if they can shave some peak, if they can really go for the demand response benefits of AMI, then that alone would pay for the deployment and they wouldn't have to, they, they wouldn't have to build the consumer benefit into that cost-benefit analysis. Now, if uh, the largest utility in the southeast is uh, is using this as as a business model, looking at really at the at the demand response benefits of this new technology, then that's I think that that's indicative of some of the business cases that are being built by utilities around the country. Right. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Um, uh, Art and uh, and Dorothy, apart from the lack of demand. Uh, are there major problems you see on the horizon for the work you're doing and, uh, and major solutions that you see available that we're not working on right now? Or are you just waiting around for the jobs to appear, basically? Well, I, I don't think... No, no, I, I don't mean to characterize We're not waiting around. Reason, waiting, around. <laughs> waiting around. I'm not sure you're trying to create the jobs, but is the demand for the jobs that the major barrier you're finding in working at the Labor Community Alliance? Uh, th there's no question. I mean, to, when the communities are uh, experiencing record unemployment, uh, it makes it difficult to, to create new opportunities, but we recognize with the enlightened leadership that we have in these 10 communities that uh, we can't close our eyes uh, uh, and we have to, continue, we have to work uh, through some of these issues. Uh, and uh, we're seeing it in, in, in different communities uh, through the use of uh, these community workforce uh, agreements. So, uh, where we heard uh, earlier the mayors, uh, as part of the negotiating, you're talking about percentages. And, uh, so we recognize that there is a space there uh, to create those opportunities in, in those communities to ensure that uh, uh, everyone can, in a community that wants to, that's committed to uh, an apprenticeship program, uh, that they have the opportunity to do that. But what, uh, to overcome those barriers, we have to make sure that we have the pipelines, the workforce <coughs> development pipelines in place so that when there, that demand does surface, that we have people to, that we move through those pipelines. And that's why 
uh, our partners uh, at the Emerald Cities uh, are, are so absolutely critical to uh, uh, establishing that, that pipeline because they can identify individuals in the community that have an interest, have a commitment, and have been introduced to the, the, the work that's entailed within uh, the industry because that's been a real problem uh, with the construction industry is that uh, folks didn't know how to get into the programs. The schools uh, weren't uh, partners with us. Uh, they wanted everybody to go to college and that didn't always work out. Uh, and that left a, a tremendous segment of the population without uh, very many alternatives. Uh, so what, we're, what we've done is we're partnering with uh, serious community-based uh, training providers uh, uh, in order to uh, assist us as we provide the, the ensure that opportunities uh, exist for members of the community. Now, there's a lot of fly-by-night uh, groups and organizations that have touted the, the green economy and all the jobs that they're going to create, but most of the time what they're doing is playing a numbers game, they're, they're getting training dollars, uh, they have no direct access to, to jobs or, or to work, and that's really what differentiates us uh, from, from everyone else, is that we are committed to career opportunities and not just jobs. Jobs are in other industries, but, but what the, the, this industry in the union sector provides uh, the, the career opportunities. So, you know, those, are, those will be the accomplishments uh, that, that we will look towards is, is that those pipelines and those communities, uh, not only in the 10, but uh, our leadership at their recent uh, national convention not only uh, provided support and encouragement for the 10 Emerald Cities, but also encouraged other communities to, be, to, to, to begin the pathway f uh, into the, the, the Emerald Cities concept, and also uh, the national leadership encouraged the use of our standardized uh, uh, core curriculum for the pre-apprenticeship programs to be incorporated into and with our training partners that we have at the Emerald Cities table. Okay, so there seems to be peace in the valley, insufficient demand. We should concentrate more on um, on the municipal buildings, the mush sector, do some sort of deal with the utilities where I hope they won't get all the business of chasing after the negative ones because otherwise Ash will be out of business. Should share it with you. Should share it with the industry you're standing up and the and the, and the, uh, and the advocates. Uh, that may involve a bunch of stuff at the state level. Uh, we can't have Sir Burke uh, save us. Those are some of the takeaways from this. Uh, Jason, um, you want to make a remark on where you see the current state or the future state of the coalitional stuff? Uh, and then I want to get to some questions. I want to give everybody a chance to get one more shot at something I didn't ask you about that you want to say to more. I want to get to some questions. Current state of the coalitional? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I thought you were saying that, well, I thought we were uh, in pretty good shape there. Uh, home start, building starts, too bad we lost, but I, I wanted to say something. You wanted to say something about how to keep that sort of coalitional structure working nationally. Um, maybe not. Maybe I misheard. Uh, no, I mean, I, you know, I, 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 think that, I think you do all of the things that you, you do to keep a coalition going. You uh, go to a lot of meetings. You listen to each other. Uh, you actually agree to a set of... Uh, values uh, or principles and you stick to them. You know, I mean, we have a hard reality here, right, which is, I mean, the Senate is still the Senate. You need 60 votes to get anything done. Uh, you have a House uh, where the leadership, I mean, let, you know, let's acknowledge or at least learn from the fact that the single biggest contribution the Republican caucus made to Homestar legislation in the past last year was to add an amendment requiring contractors to certify they didn't hire convicted sex offenders. Um, you know, getting a, at that big societal problem of air sealing and sex crimes, I, you know. So, I mean, we've got, we, we've got a big political problem that we've got to deal with. Um, that that is, doesn't mean that we can't get, get some stuff done, um, but I think, frankly, most of, of the action is going to be at the state and local level. Is there anything anyone wants to say about the effect of development of the industry before we turn over to questions? Dorothy. I just want to say I don't think we should give up on uh, major public investment. Uh, just because the House changed hands now doesn't mean there isn't right. potential for the future for the same people who are angry about being unemployed. 
to get behind investment in some of these uh, investments in energy efficiency that would create jobs and that would save the government money in the long run. So let's not give up on something that actually there is major logic behind. Uh, on Walsh Ball, he'll never give up. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not advocating for that, by the way. I just, I, I, we need to be realistic about it. That's all. Well, and yeah, just the other parts of standing up an industry, which I think we're all interested in doing, um, you know, industries have a lot of standardization in them so that you can actually uh, buy what it is you want and get it in a standardized way. So I think there's um, you know, a lot of progress being made on a number of those fronts. Um, there's certainly more work to do. Some examples include um, at least some of the things we're working on. One, a new mile per gallon rating for the car so you can get a score on your home on a scale of one to 10 and know if your home, how efficient your home is in the climate in which you reside. And if we can just get information like that out um, and in the hands of a lot of people, we're looking at that as sort of a demand uh, generation type thing, uh, particularly when you can get it in the hands of somebody offering these services. You know, the workforce, a um, lot of good progress there in terms of developing guidelines uh, for the requirements to do different types of home improvement work uh, that can roll into training accreditation standards uh, as well as um, certification standards. We have some, but I think to the extent we're even more standardized uh, and we enhance the mobility of our workforce, uh, that's what we need to be talking about an in industry. And then you get to some of the financial uh, mechanisms. Uh, there has been a lot put out there in terms of revolving loan funds, loan loss reserves, uh, but I would sort of guess that as you look state by state by state, uh, the terms are all a little bit different here and there, and it really makes it hard for, for folk to play. So we're also trying to pull together sort of the best practices of what's going on uh, in uh, the hopes that that can sort of lead to some more standardized practices too. Uh, so we really do start to talk more about an industry as um, sort of a standardized industry uh, as opposed to a cottage industry, which is one of the things we really have to overcome. DOE's taking the lead on that last thing, not Treasury? Or are you doing it with Treasury? Or? We would do that with Treasury, but Treasury. from a best practices standpoint, with all our grantees, yeah. we can like pull that okay. stuff together. You want to say anything about building standards, or is, we assume everyone knows about it? Don't say anything about it. Yeah. Codes that's, are good. That's on the way through. Our, our, yeah, last comment you wanted to get out uh, Just to, I don't want anybody to lose sight of the, the goals of the Emerald Cities Collaborative. If we want to uh, green our cities, through uh, deep retrofitting, uh, we want to build our cities with high with high road standards, and we want to strengthen our democracy to ensure that we have strong labor community compacts in order to uh, achieve uh, our goals. And I think the other thing to keep in mind is that uh, the mayors uh, of these communities are absolutely critical. Uh, as we as we move forward, because as we learned, as somebody mentioned earlier about New Orleans uh, and the breaking of the levees, they had no public policies in place that uh, required the, the, the use and the hiring of, of local folks. Uh, in these Emerald Cities, part of the compact includes the, the use of, of local residents uh, that have completed the, all these different uh, programs, so it's absolutely critical that those policies are, are put in place and they're part of the Emerald Cities uh, Collaborative. So uh, we'll, 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 yeah. we'll do everything that we can to support those mayors as they, they go forward with those ever important and, uh, and critical community workforce agreements. Are there absolutely thank seven you. comments to make? Yeah. Thank you for your question. Good. Let's hope you're not for a lot of questions. Bill, I think you have five or six people. Uh, Scott, I recognize an Amaya and Bill. So let's go to somebody else. I don't. How about your name? I will say there is a possibility, can't comment on, <laughs> on that particular program right now, but I mean, 
Oh. Um, I'm not commenting on that right now. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but uh, I would just say generally anything where programs like Power Saver that can be utilized from financial institutions to provide um, assistance to sort of uh, bridge that gap in, in credit and provide some type of uh, skin in the game, I think can be beneficial to standing up an industry. And so particularly getting at sort of the residential sector, um, that's one of the, the pieces that I think will be critical to addressing um, energy efficiency finance for, for residential. It's also new leadership in FIFO, right? So that may change um, uh, so in the back, uh, let's see, uh, Scott Burns, let's do it with Scott, and then Amaya, and then Ruben, and Bill, is your, is your hand still up? Let's do Bill, and probably you, Ruben. But let's get some other people in the discussion, too. Anyway, Scott, take it away. One. Yeah, um, so uh, this is probably for Trent and Bartley, for Kathleen. Um, we coordinate, set up an every technology, we coordinate the Chicago Better Builders, and I run the investment programs, and I run the conservation. <coughs> Utilities don't want to do what they see as money business. Lenders don't want to do what they see as utility business. Nobody wants to claim ownership outside of the institutions in this room for job creation. And so I think we need to get at these industry positions. We're creating an industry here. We're creating intermediaries and partnerships. Well, Trent, I mean, if you've looked at the Chicago experience, we have a service offering. What's the problem? Is it scale? Are you going to write the report? I mean, I don't mean to be pushy. But we're in 2011 here. We're, I mean, you don't need an economics degree to know, yeah, it'd be nice to get a small number of big buildings to get started. But that's not going to solve the credit problem for a much larger number of smaller buildings to be retrofit. So how do, what is the, what are you saying to your, uh, your company's position is on actually getting to this? You know, what kind of help do you need? <laughs> Loaded question. Um, I think that one education in time. I would say over the last two years, uh, given the, the amount of focus that's been put on uh, financing energy efficiency, we've educated a number of different parts of the bank uh, with regards to energy efficiency, and also working together within a large financial institution. We are talking about um, takes on commercial finance, residential finance, mortgage finance, municipal finance, there's a lot of different disciplines who, who have to participate in understanding exactly how do you finance energy efficiency projects. And I think that um, us and others like, 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 our, like ourselves have uh, spent a good time doing the education. Just inside the firm. Just inside the firm. I mean, you're, you're talking, you know, we talk about energy efficiency as one thing. Um, but when you break it into a larger financial institution, there's so many different parts of the bank that, that participate mm -hmm. that you need to get um, um, people aligned. I think that's something that's uh, taking place. So there's an education period of time. Then I would also say that you know it, the, the data is helpful, um, and, and but part of it comes back to what the size is and, and what is the what does the market look like, um, and. We've have had numerous conversations with some in this room and, and others outside of it, but part of the issue becomes what do you do with these particular loans, um, and, and and is there a market for them? Um, are you holding the loans on your books? What does that look like? And it's hard as you're getting in sort of this bridge area, sort of what do you do with that particular industry? So that's why we've been leaning upon looking at things like loan loss reserves to help provide what we would want to have as financial institutions and financial industry is sort of some type of liquidity on these types of products. And that is something that, you know, we're all still still working to figure out, particularly on the sector that you're, you're discussing. The mush sector is a completely different animal. Um, and then you have some other institutions, some other types of CNI projects that look different in complexion as well. But when you're talking about pool loan programs for smaller projects, that's, that is the, the harder nut to crack.
this in an ending discussion. Let's, let's move on to uh, another. Uh, Phil, we want to do you. Do you have a question? Uh, yeah, I That'd be great. <laughs> but be, but speak up as well. But I would, but I would, like, voice to, of yours. I, I would like to ask uh, uh, actually a question of the group at large because we've heard from a couple of different folks something that I began hearing when I first began working in the energy efficiency industry in 1979. Yeah. And that was to scale this industry, we need two things we need better education to consumers, and we need better access to easy financing. If you can 
uh, get more of the, uh, this done through the ESCOs, and they're willing to be more fair about actually how much they really can save, split some of that savings with the municipal players, so the municipal players can do that. Anybody who can speak for the ESCOs, is that a viable path to be moving down, or are we not going to be able to get ESCOs to do a more equitable share so we can do more of the high road? Well, maybe we can get to the residential market and some of the money left over. Yeah, I'd, I'll try to do this briefly. ESCO's Energy Services Company, and I think most know companies that are willing to do the audit, guarantee the savings, and actually find the financing. Anyways, in short, I, I think that most ESCOs, and, and we can talk offline, most ESCOs typically uh, don't share in the savings. They'll actually leave 100% of the savings to repay loans. Um, the question is, how much of the savings are they willing to guarantee to repay loans? Some of the larger companies have gotten overly conservative and the amount that they're willing to guarantee to justify the loan has shrunk based on their risk appetite. There are a lot of smaller regional companies. We're kind of a national company, but we're privately held and we're willing to take on a different kind of level of transparency and risk. So I, I would just say that uh, the ESCO industry is evolving. And I think if you're just looking to the big players, you may have kind of only seen one or two lenses of what's really possible. I, I would say seek deeper understanding of how many ESCOs and companies are out there that are willing to be uh, more uh, to take on the, the kind of work that you want to do. 30 seconds for Jason to respond to. I, I, I would just say what we do is we, we require we I mean I'm preaching to the choir here. Uh, we we require the quality assurance stuff, whether it's in the in the Green Jobs Green New York legislation, or in Homestar legislation, and 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 we make the argument not simply from from a justice standpoint, although let's always make that argument. We make it from the standpoint of the 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 growth to scale of the industry. I mean I think we can make a very good argument that the, particularly the home retrofit industry will not grow to scale unless we have very good quality assurance at both the local and the national level, right? Consumers won't know what they're getting for their retrofit dollar. They won't know where to go to get the best contractors. Um, workers won't know that they can get into an industry with career potential. Uh, financiers won't be able to develop affordable uh, loan products. So, I mean, I, I, think, I think we make the argument and we try to get in policy. Okay, and with that, we're gonna wrap it up right now. Denise, you wanna say again where the reception First of all, I, I want to thank all of you for coming far and wide from the West Coast, from the South, to, to be here today. It's an important conversation. It's one that we will continue to have, uh, bringing our, our national experts into local communities to, to build these partnerships. And, and the, the answers will be uniquely crafted, I think, at the local level. So we, we look to engage our 10 cities and, and many more going forward. Um, having said that, we want you to celebrate where we've come, knowing that we have uh, many more distances to go. Uh, make your way over to the National Building Museum. We'll have some food, we'll have some drinks. It's in a beautiful venue to, to look at uh, you know, the beauty of, of what Washington, D.C. has to offer. Uh, this is an exceptional group of uh, specialists here. You're going to thank them. I will, but, but not now. You want them there at 7, right? No, no, no. Six. Six, six o'clock, you can tool over there and go to the books. It's actually the best planning. I'm an urban planner, so the best planning bookstore, I think, uh, in the world. And see the exhibits. And we have a little more time because we had to leave a little earlier. So, uh, yeah, quarter to six, we're, we're ready to open up the doors and make you comfortable. And uh, again, thank you. We will uh, make a difference in 2011. We will stand up this industry in partnership with each and every one. Thank you for that.